this morning, Mark chapter number 12. Before we read our text, I want to give you a little bit of a running start here at what we're dealing with and kind of lay out that context just by way of a reminder. If you've been here with us, you have been following the storyline. And uh, two weeks ago, we preached from Mark 11 and in verses 27 through 33, they, they come to the Lord. They're the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. They come to Jesus Christ. Don't forget he's in his early 30s. You know, they're the old men. They know it all. And uh, this young man is coming along, and he's showing some potential. He's pretty sharp. But, uh, you know, they want to grill him. They want to make sure that he's on the level because, you know, of course, they're the old men. And so they're kind of questioning Jesus Christ, and he's got wisdom from God. He's got the Spirit of God. He's filled with God's Spirit. God put him where he is. So, really, who are they? Amen? And uh, they come and try to grill the Lord, and the Lord just kind of lays it down to them. I mean, he just comes right back at them as they question the Lord and try to back the Lord into a corner. He steps around and just pulls out the sword and puts it right in their heart. And they said, well, if we answer him, uh, this side's going to get mad at us. If we answer him this way, we're going to look bad, and so let's just not give him an answer. And Jesus said, all right, you don't give me an answer, neither do I tell you. Goodbye. I love that, man. It's just so cool. And then you see in Mark chapter 12, verse number 1, he begins to preach a message to them. And it's a message we discussed in detail last week. And he talks about the husbandman that, that has a field and expects some fruit from his field. And how he came to find that field and they crucify, they, they, they run him off and they run off his prophets. And then eventually they crucify his son. They kill his son and say, we'll take the field that's ours. And I told you that represents that Christian life where... Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And if you're born again this morning, if you're saved this morning, that means, by the way, not that your good works outweigh your bad works or that you're a member of our church or that you tithe or any of that foolishness. That means you realized you're a sinner and that there's nothing you can do about that fact. No matter how hard you try, you still keep sinning. Every sinner is going to burn in a lake of fire without Jesus Christ. You realize he died on the cross to save you and that you trusted him as your personal savior. You received his free gift of salvation. At the time you do that, you're born again. Once you're born again, the Bible tells you you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So now you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about how he'll come by his vineyard and he'll look for fruit from those that he saved. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're saved. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, then he is trying to bring forth fruit in your life. And when the owner of the vineyard comes into his vineyard and says, where's my fruit? You ought to be ready to give him what he asks for. It's our reasonable service that we produce fruit for the Lord. And so what happens is Jesus preaches this very tough message to them. And they got very angry with him in verse number 12, Mark 12, 12. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went their way. They got angry because they said, when Jesus got in that pulpit, he was gunning for me. And you should never gun for somebody from the pulpit. They got mad because they knew Jesus was preaching right at them. Amen. It's okay to have direct, straight preaching as long as you're not, you know, grinding your personal acts. As long as this isn't my personal vendetta or issue between me and somebody. Amen. No friends. Back here. No friends. When I step up here, I don't have a friend in this room. No foes. Nobody here is my enemy. In other words, I'm not targeting you this morning. And you're not my buddy this morning. Oh, well, that's going to offend my buddy, so I'm going to tiptoe around my buddy. It can be a very lonely position, but it's a very blessed position. No friends, no foes, no family. Oh, well, I'm so much closer to the preacher and his family than everybody else. No family. Don't kid yourself. Amen. No finances. Don't offend them. They have money. No finances. What am I going to do if everybody gets mad? No finances. There's no motive here but truth. I said all that for this reason. This morning, I couldn't decide what to name or title the message. So I got two titles, and I, we're going to stick with the second one. The first one is trying to manipulate Jesus Christ. 
trying to manipulate the Lord. And that's really what we're going to kind of drive at this morning. But the second title that I kind of settled on is Alcohol, Dope, and Shacking Up. (laughs) This is not going to be your typical message that you get from me. But I'm going to show you scripture, and we're going to go through the passage, and I'm going to show you what the Bible teaches. You say, Preacher, why that subject? I've been getting more and more questions, so don't be like, Oh, this is all about me. Trust me, my world is just a little bit bigger than one individual. There's been rising questions more and more from born-again believers that honestly should have some of these things already settled in their minds and should have an understanding of these things, but more and more these questions are coming up. And I'm telling you, from multiple sources, hear that, please. Because I don't want you to be like, wow, what was his deal? And I don't want you to shut your mind off either because I'm not going to give you the typical message on these subjects. I'm not just going to kind of try to twist the Bible and twist every passage of Scripture to line up with my doctrine or my preference or my standard. Have you seen that from me in six years? Be honest. Have you seen that from me? All right, we're going to let the Bible say what it says, and we're going to go with the Scriptures this morning, all right? Mark chapter 12, let's start reading in verse 13. And they send unto him a certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Now, don't forget, they're mad because he just preached a message that really ticked them off. And so what do they do? They get together the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say, There is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren. The first took a wife, and dying left no seed. The second took her and died. Neither left he any seed. The third likewise. And the seven had her, and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore... When they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. Oh, now we got him. Jesus answering said unto them, Ye there, ye do not, do, excuse me, do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the great, the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God. And there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all hurled burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we love you this morning. And I know this isn't probably going to be one of the most exciting messages we've ever heard. And, and Father, there's like a couple different viewpoints I know in our church. And 
people look at these issues from two different standpoints. And Lord, I don't want to go to either side. I want to be right where you are. And I, I ask you to help me with that, Father. Help me not to worry about who might get offended and who might not like it and whether or not they're going to get up a miff tree at me or not. And Father, I mean that in, in light of those who are more conservative and those who are more liberal. And Lord, I could care less. I just want to be with you this morning. And Lord, I genuinely want to help these people. I want to help our church. As I've been praying throughout this week, Lord, I want BBC to be the church you'd have it to be. Help us to be the people you'd have us to be. I'd rather have the right people, your people, and the right spirit, and the right balance, and the right standard that would please you than to worry about trying to just bust out the doors and exceed the parking lot limits and pack the building and increase the budget and all that foolishness. Father, I want to be a minister of Jesus Christ. Nourish up in the words of faith and sound doctrine. So, Father, open our eyes and give us understanding here not only of the doctrine, but of the God who wrote the doctrine. Help us to not err uh, and help us not to err because of our lack of Bible knowledge, but also help us not to err because of our lack of knowledge of God as well. Give us the right spirit this morning and help me, Father. I pray every person in here would understand, even if they disagree with me and they know it and I know it, I pray they'd still know that their pastor loves them and isn't trying to hurt them and that this thing would be something that we'd leave here chewing on and thinking about and having the proper attitude, the proper spirit that you might be glorified in our midst, in our homes, and in our families. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Don't you despise a preacher that gets in a pulpit and takes the Bible, or gets on television and takes the Bible, and manipulates that Bible in order to control people to get them to do what they want? Don't you hate that stuff? You ever seen a preacher take a passage of scripture and twist it to make it fit his viewpoint on an issue? And then preach it as though if you don't see it his way, there's something wrong with you, you're wicked, you're going to burn in hell, and God's never going to bless you. Don't you hate that stuff? I hate it. I despise manipulating God's word and manipulating God's people. I would rather, and I'm not just saying this to try to sound tough or be crude, I would rather hang out with a bunch of dope dealers than a bunch of preachers who peddle God's word to make money. At least I know what I'm dealing with when I deal with a dope dealer. But you get around a manipulative salesman style preacher who will manipulate that Bible. You don't know when you're stepping on a bomb and when you're not. You don't know when you crossed the line and when you didn't. You don't know where he's going to come down on any issue. You can't read him. You can't understand him because he's always testing the winds of where everybody in the church is and where the politics of the day are and where the culture is and adjusting himself accordingly so that nobody takes his money out of his wallet. I despise that kind of junk, don't you? He's using God's people for his own good. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you use God that way? Got real quiet, didn't it? Let's take it a step further. Do you use the Bible that way? Do you run to the Word of God to try to find things that justify something you want to do because you want to do it? And could care less who it affects and how it affects them. Don't you think it's pretty wicked when somebody manipulates the Bible? Don't you think it would be pretty awful if you stood before the Lord Jesus Christ and he said, why did you spend your whole Christian life trying to manipulate me and my words to get your own way so you could live a pleasure-filled life? When I promised you that I'd bless you, I promised you I'd help you, I promised you I'd give you joy, I said I'd give you life and life more abundantly, why did you constantly try to manipulate everything to your own benefit to do things you wanted to do instead of just let me have my way? Don't you think that would be a pretty scary thing to answer for? The chief priests and the scribes in this chapter, look at verse 13. The chief priests and the scribes get together and they send unto Jesus Christ the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now this is something you need to understand. The Pharisees and the Herodians were not friends. Pharisees believed that the Jews had liberty. They didn't like the Roman bondage. They were all about their Jewish traditions and their Jewish laws and their Jewish rules. The Herodians, on the other hand, were Jews that had kind of defected and they were partial to Herod and to the Roman government. 
So on one hand, you got those who, you know, are very strict about Judaism and all the Judaistic laws. <laughs> and on the other hand, you got those who are kind of tuned in politically to the day to make sure that their favor was taken care of. So you got your religious crowd and you got your political crowd. And they get together when they want to set up Jesus Christ. Funny thing how enemies can become friends if they both have a common enemy. You'll get a couple of people come to church and, and you'll know about their background. You'll know about who they are and their personality types. They'll be like, those two would kill each other. But just wait until they both find a common enemy or a common thing they're rebellious about in that church. They'll find each other even though before they were like, they were like polar opposites and pushing each other away. Now all of a sudden they kind of click together. It's amazing. My dad always said, birds of a feather flock together. You just kind of gravitate to that person that has a common like or dislike that you have. And now here the Pharisees and the Herodians are hooking up. And all they're trying to do is set up Jesus Christ. Hey, should we give tribute to Caesar or not? Come on, Jesus. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to break the law? Or are you going to tell us Pharisees that we are under a Jewish bondage? Didn't you just ride into town as the king? Weren't we just singing Hosanna on the highest? Blessed is cometh in the name of the Lord. Aren't you going around preaching that you're the king of the Jews? So are you going to submit to Herod, who's a worldly king, Jesus? They're just trying to set the Lord up. That's all they're doing to him. They're manipulating Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice, let's dive a little bit below the surface, all right? We're setting the stage to get into the issues of the day. We're setting the stage to apply this thing to modern-day Christianity. Look at the reasons that they manipulate the Lord. That's what you need to notice. In your own life, if you try to manipulate Jesus Christ, there's a motive behind that. Are you with me? I'm not talking about, I'm not going to stay on the surface this morning. And I, I've run the references, I know the references, I, I pretty much promise you, and I don't say this arrogantly because, you know, you could trump me, but I pretty much promise you, you dig up a reference in support of what you want to support on the subjects I'm going to talk about. I've already seen them and studied them. I'm not saying that arrogantly, I'm just telling you, these aren't subjects that are fresh and new for me. I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk, all right? I'm just telling you, I'm not going there with you. Because I think too much preaching is surface all the time. Too much preaching is molding the outside all the time. Too much preaching is trying to live up to the standard that is dictated and preached from the pulpit. I'm going to give you Bible truth this morning, and I'm going to let you go home and do with it what you will. I'm not meddling in your life. I don't want to know. Ignorance is stinking bliss. Amen. That's why I logged out of Facebook and try to stay off it. Hallelujah. Ignorance is bliss. Now, my wife gets on there, amen, she posts pictures now and then, and I'm not preaching it's a sin to have Facebook, but I try to stay off it because it irritates me to death. We're going to go below the surface this morning. I'm not going to pick at you. You do what you want. Did you hear me? You'll answer to God for it. But I'm going to dive below the surface, and we're going to get at the motives. The reasons we manipulate Jesus Christ is that we seek to justify ourselves. Some of you already are ticked off. And all you're going to do, all you're going to do is like throw fuel on my fire. Amen. I got out of that when I was 26 years old and my deacon would sit there in my first church and cross his arm whenever I crossed the line just like that, sit back and shake his head no at me. Now, by the grace of God, I'm a little bit more mature than I used to be, but you're not going to make me back off by giving me a dirty look. I kicked the pulpit one morning, and he went. I said, you know what the thing is about Pharisees? I said, you can always tell who the Pharisees are by when you kick them. And he said, and I kicked it again, and the pulpit almost went off the platform. Now, I was 26. It was 10 years ago. I hope I've, you know, chilled out a little bit since then. But I learned early on that this kind of stuff, and this kind of stuff, and this kind of stuff, and... Ain't phasing me. Amen. Now, their problem was they're trying to manipulate the Lord because they got once had something in their heart and in their mind that they wanted to force him to say for them so they could justify what they wanted. What's the issue? The issue is their motive. In verses 14 and 15, watch what they do. They were come to him, they say to him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. 
Preacher, we know you tell it like it is. Thank you for bold, authoritative, King James Bible preaching. Go ahead and tell everybody else where they're wrong. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teacheth the way of God in truth. All right. All right, you believe that? Then let's deal with the truth. They said, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Why are they asking? How many of you like paying taxes? There's no hands. How many of you like getting refunds? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, you know what? People that get refunds don't complain about the IRS, do they? I guarantee you those same people would complain about the IRS if what they owed equaled what the refund is. What's the motive? What's the motive? Money, right? Why are they asking Jesus Christ this question? Because they love their money, that's why. And they're looking for a spiritual excuse not to pay their taxes. You know what you ought to do? Pay your stinking taxes and don't cheat. Amen. Hey, that was good preaching. I'll say it again. Pay your stinking taxes and don't cheat. Amen. Amen. By the way, I understand our government is pretty unfair, don't you? You know what I hate? I hate the fact that the rich have to pay our bill. We got a messed up system. Why? Because people love money. They're asking Jesus Christ this question for one reason. Love money. They don't have the right motive behind it. Look at verse number 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there's no resurrection. And they asked him, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Why are they asking Jesus that question? They don't believe that there is a resurrection. What is their motive for asking the question that they're asking? Their motive has nothing to do with truth. They're trying to give Jesus a hypothetical situation. I mean, how, have you, how many of you know a woman, who is a guy who has seven brothers, they all die, she marries them all, and never has a baby. What are the odds of this even happening? I imagine if you search the planet, you might find me one example. You know what it is? It's a bunch of stupidity is what it is. Well, preacher, if I'm on my deathbed, and none of the medications are satisfying... Is it okay in that case, hypothetically, if I smoke a joint? What are you talking about? You know, we're always trying to do, set Jesus up. Their motive was not pure and their motive was not right. And you want to know something else? They went in saying, we know that you got the truth. We know you teach the truth. And we know, Jesus, you speak the truth. And we know you're not intimidated by us. You're not worried about what we're going to think. You are, you are quite the man. I mean, of all the preachers, I want to come hear you. But we ain't going to do what you say. You know what Romans 10 tells you? Your own mouth condemns you. If you study your own argument long enough, you're going to find out you're tripping over your own tongue. And it's just like, what? Okay. <laughs> What'd you ask? <laughs> Have a nice day. You know why? The motive is wrong. Nine times out of ten, you can tell what somebody wants you to say when they ask the question. My preacher said this. There's three reasons people ask you a question. Number one, they want to find out how much you know. They're setting Jesus up. You know what? I could care less to tell you how much I know. I learned a long time ago, the smartest guy acts dumb. I learned that from my mom. She pretends, huh? What? And she's into every bit of your business and has absolutely understands every single thing. I mean, she was sharp, man. She busted me every time. You know what I learned from my dad? Only give out half of your canteen. He'd give me a half an answer, and he always had another answer ready. <laughs> it was just miserable. <laughs> I don't care if you know how much I know. I could care less. I don't even care to answer a question when it's just probing to see how much I know. Number two, they want you to know how much they know. I, I, don't, I don't stay awake at night wondering how intelligent you are. I wonder what their IQ is. That guy's really smart. So what? Number three, they really want to know the answer. Oh, praise the Lord, let's talk. They weren't asking Jesus for the right reasons. 
They were setting him up and trying to manipulate him. That's all there was to it. You know what the problem is? The problem is a heart. It's a wicked heart. It's a motive that loves money. It's a motive that loves their religion. It's a motive of worldliness. They start diving into this question. I got to wonder what these boys are even thinking about this woman for anyhow. You notice already we got money in the context and we got morality in the context. Immediately, they're, they're worried about who she's going to be in the resurrection. What are you talking about in the resurrection? What, what do you mean in the resurrection? You're quoting me about Moses and you're telling me what Moses said. You're quoting Bible at me and you have no understanding of the future. You have no understanding of the spirituality. All you know about the Bible is what applies to this life, what applies to your flesh, what applies to this world, and you don't even understand the spiritual things behind what's being said. You know what the problem is? Too many preachers have tried to debate people on a worldly level. Well, look at this verse. Well, new wine is freshly scraped grape juice, which, freshly squeezed grape juice, which nine times out of ten it is. It's not alcoholic. About nine times out of ten. You hear what I said? Don't, don't even try to trap me. Don't try to set me up. I hate that stuff. Try to set me up. Nine times out of ten it is. Well, until I drink it, what with you? New with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't that what he said? He didn't say, I can't wait for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're all going to get hammered. And he didn't say strap a bomb to your chest and go blow some Christians up and you'll get 70 virgins. Did he? You know what that is? That's people taking the Bible and taking spirituality and taking religion and only seeing what applies to this life. I I, I researched that 70 virgin stuff this week. You know, that that actually isn't even something that's technically taught in the Quran. That was something that some one of their scholars wrote that is alluded to in the Quran, and there's quite a few Quran verses to support it, but it doesn't say specifically 70. So I guess the more people you blow up, the more you get when you get there. But they said the Quran is very clear in that there are many physical pleasures in heaven. One of them being... The marriage relationship, I try to say it discreetly. That's a bunch of stinking foolishness. And you know what that is? That's religion. And religion is only preoccupied with how this book and how God and how its religious rituals can benefit it in this life. Have you noticed the exponential growth of the self-help preachers who take the Bible and won't lay out anything that God actually says, but will just try to help you have a better view of yourself and a better psychological understanding and a better day and greater finances and a better marriage and wonderful children and you know a good financial plan for the future and a great community involvement and all this kind of foolishness that only applies to this life. Listen, if this book only applies to this life, if my Salvation only applies to this life. We are of all men most miserable. I'm glad it ain't about this life only. Make sure your questions have to do with the life to come and the spiritual world around you that you can't see and not what will gratify you, not what will justify you. If I'm wrong, can I tell you the honest truth? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And the world will not stop. And God will not have a stroke and fall off his throne. I say it reverently. I I say that reverently. God won't have a heart attack if I turn out to be wrong about something. And if I'm wrong, I'll say, hey, look, guess what, folks? I'm sorry, I was wrong. Big deal. You might laugh and, you know, we got him. I'll get in the car, go home, and eat my spaghetti, and go play with my dog in the backyard, and I won't think twice about it. You know why? Because I'd rather God be right than me. Because this life and who I am and what I want doesn't matter. He matters. And you want to know something else? You matter. I'd rather give you the truth than to try to justify myself all the time. You know, we spend too much time doing justifying ourselves. Asking questions that are irrelevant. So, if I take a social drink but I'm not drunk, is that okay? What's wrong with a social drink, preacher? Every wino knows, well, Jesus turned the water to wine. I've done enough street work. I've preached in enough jails. I've been in enough mission, rescue missions to know every wino knows that verse. You know what every fornicator knows? 
Every fornicator knows those verses that, you know, while marriage is flesh joining flesh, and as long as we're monogamous, we don't have a license. I mean, who's the state? We're married in the eyes of God. That's a good question, isn't it? You know, we've had people, we go out door knocking, we bring them in, praise the Lord. We've had people in our church for a long time in that situation. You don't hear me beat up on them, do you? You don't hear me single them out or point it out, do you? I want to give people time to grow. Time to get it together. I understand we're in a different kind of a culture nowadays, and it's going to take some patience and long-suffering and kindness, and I don't want them walking in here going, oh, everybody's staring at me. I mean, relax, man. We're supposed to reach people, amen? amen. You aren't the spiritual police, and you're not the Holy Spirit of the church. Amen. And I'll show you in a minute where I'm at what I mean by that. But well, we got a generation, and I'm talking to you that know the truth and have been in church a while. we got a generation of people that know how to make excuses for every single sin they can commit. And it's going so far now, no longer is it just whether or not a Christian can have a social drink. I heard that in the 80s every Sunday. My preacher just harped on that and homosexuals. And he called them fags. I know that offended some of you, I'm sure. He's like, a bunch of faggots are such a sodomites. God's going to judge us, nation, a bunch of sodomites. Every week, man. And everybody was just like, praise the Lord, amen, that's right, brother. You know what I mean? Even people that were lost to come and go, yeah, it is pretty bad, ain't it? <laughs> Nowadays, the saved people go, should you have said that? Sodomite? That's a Bible word. What's wrong with it? Nowadays, the, the issues are like out of control. No longer it's like, is it okay for us to have a social drink? Now it's like, well, what's wrong with smoking dope? It's natural. God wouldn't have made it if it was a sin. You know, there's a lot of things that are natural. That if you eat them or smoke them, they will kill you. So did God intend for you to go eat and smoke a bunch of things that will kill you? Rattlesnakes are natural. <laughs> Why don't we all go play with a rattlesnake this afternoon? Don't do that. I'm not recommending that. Some nut job. I'm sure there's at least one nut job here. They'll be like, well, the pastor told me to do it. And here I am in court. No, I swear. We're not charismatic. I promise. You ever hear the stupid art? I mean, just stupid, 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 stupid. Let me just grind this axe just for a second. Have you noticed a movement going on in our government, in our politics? Not only are they trying to legalize marijuana, but they're trying to legalize gay marriage. Anybody, I mean, is there any discerning Christians in this room that have the Holy Spirit of God and a King James Bible? Do we have anybody like that here this morning? Okay, so since you got the right spirit... God's spirit, and since you got God's book in your lap, do you have the discernment it takes to figure out what the adversary is doing to a once great nation? Why are you asking me the question? Is it okay to smoke dope? It's not as bad as drinking. That's a funny thing, ain't it? The same guys that want to say it's okay to have a social drink are saying, well, what about dope, and it's safer to drive and function high on pot than it is to drive and function on alcohol. You know, Romans 10 is so good. Your own mouth stinking condemns you. We know you got the truth, Lord, but we're going to do whatever we want anyhow, and we're going to take everything you say, and we're going to set you up, and we're going to find verses to justify what we want to do. Marriage is flesh joining flesh. How do you like that? That's a marriage in God's eyes. Adam knew his wife and they two were one flesh. Boom, done. That was the ceremony. Tell me, let me tell you something. Some punk come along and fall in love with one of my little girls. I spent my life trying to raise and loving and cuddling with them on a couch to watch a movie while they go, Daddy, can I go get my blankie? No, my youngest one likes my blankie now. I had a blanket, amen. You've heard my, my blanket before, right? My coffee, my blanket, and my Bible in the morning. You make fun of me all you want. The American Indians walked around with blankets on them, and they scalp you, man. <laughs> I, my blanket's gone. My youngest has it. Daddy, I'm going to go get your blankie. It's got holes in it. She loops her finger through it, puts her thumb in her mouth, and holds that blankie and sits on my lap. I mean, praise Jesus. That's a good time. <laughs> I'm spending my whole life raising these kids. As some punk's going to want to come along because she's attractive... Because they got chemistry, and you know, I'll, I'll be monogamous to her, and I'm gonna, you know, just shack up with her. No, man, you wanna marry my daughter? You promise her for life. You pay her bills, you swear your life away. Well, what if she goes crazy later and takes all my money? Do you love her? Or do you love your money? You see, the problem, folks, is a lack of commitment. You see, the issue is not whether or not marriage is flesh joined in flesh, the issue is your heart. 
Why wouldn't you say, hey, I love you so much, I want to have an intimate relationship with you. I want to produce some children. Congratulations. Now everybody knows. I don't know if I was supposed to do that or not, but we love you guys, and I'm excited about it. It's, the truth is out, right? Okay. Now it is. <laughs> love each other we want to have a child so you know what here's my life it's yours till death do us part better or worse richer or poorer sickness and in health forsaking all others only unto you so long as we both shall live you see the difference in the heart One's a cheater. Aren't we in the New Testament? Are we in the New Testament? Are you under the letter of the law? No, you're under the spirit of the law, right? So the one guy that says, yeah, I got you, and as long as I'm with you, I'll only have you. He's wicked. I don't care if he signed a marriage certificate or not. Why? Because of his spirit. Because of his heart. The guy who says, you know what, will come what may. I'm yours, you're mine, in the eyes of God, before this company, I promise. He's right with God. Why? Because of the heart. You see, the motive behind what we're doing, folks, we're always trying to justify ourselves, and we're asking stupid questions that condemn our own self. Let me ask you a question. If they legalize gay marriage, does that make it right? Is pornography legal, most of it? I know there's some pretty... Pretty disgusting stuff out there that's not. But is pornography legal? Is it right? How about, I hate this word. I absolutely hate this word. How about gentlemen's clubs? Your own mouth condemns you, man. I mean, I don't imagine there's anybody, I I couldn't imagine there's any regular members of our church that I'm stepping on any toes right now. In my wildest dreams, I wouldn't imagine that. Been around people too long, haven't I? You're not a gentleman, you're a pig. And by the way, abusing some woman who got abused her whole life and has only figured out one way to survive and she's miserable, she's sorrowful, she feels degraded. Are they legal? Does that make it right? So why are we talking about pot? Who cares if they legalize it? Does that make it right? I want you to notice, now, now let's get into some, my, I made the point, right? The issue is the heart, right? Now let's get into some Bible. Look at verse number 24. Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err? Why? First of all, because ye know not the Scriptures. That's the first reason you made a mistake. Oh, preacher, we got you now. I can show you some verses, preacher. Well, you know, yippee skippy for you, genius. But the scribes could too, and the Pharisees could, and the Herodians could, and the Sadducees could. Just because you can show a verse doesn't mean you got the full balance or all the truth on it. You better be real careful about quoting a verse. Amen. There's a spirit behind how, how and why you quote some verses, isn't there? You ever notice the devil? What does he do with the Lord? He quotes scripture, doesn't he? Oops. You think God put that in the Bible by accident? He wants to show you how people misuse and abuse the Bible. There's a good example. We had, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, quite a few years ago, we started the ladies' meetings. Am I, I'm I'm doing a lot of rhetorical questions today because I'm trying to help you think. All right? And by the way, our ladies' meetings have been great. It's been a blessing. Preachers are, preacher, what are you doing? No, brother, oh, man, nothing. We haven't really had too much trouble here. Thank God for that. I appreciate that, ladies. I'm glad to keep it that way so we can keep having ladies' meetings. Amen. I know how to solve my problems. Just cancel the ladies' meetings and problem solved. Amen. No more strife. But it's been a blessing. Really? You think I'm kidding, don't you? (laughs) It's been a blessing. We had some people in the church. You know, I said, well, I'm the overseer, and my wife is my wife. And so how do I oversee this thing? Let me tell you something, ladies. If I pulled you in the office because you were the head of the ladies' ministry, I said, what would you do that for? Why'd you say that? No, I don't want you to set it up that way. I don't think that's a smart move. 
I think that could cause trouble. You know what you do? <gasps> oh, my goodness. <laughs> and your, bro, your husband like, don't you talk to my wife like that. I'll break your little jaw. <laughs> you know what I can do with my wife? She goes, yes, dear. She's been through some things in the ministry. She's learned what to do and what not to do and what to say and what not to say, and it's gone pretty smoothly. She's not perfect. No family. She's not perfect, but she's the right pick for the job. And I can oversee it through her. So I said from the beginning, this is how we're going to do it. Well, there's some people in the church just, boy, they just felt like, well, I should be the head of the ladies' ministry. No, you shouldn't. You're the wrong pick. So they grab a verse of scripture. Well, the elder are to teach the younger. And go around quoting that verse of scripture real loud. You know what they're doing? All they're doing is trying to undermine the pastor and undermine the pastor's wife and get their own agenda driven in the church. Quoting scripture but with the wrong spirit. Not understanding the full context and what that thing was talking about. And how, when, where, what, and why. Be careful about just throwing scripture out there. And thinking, here's my justification for what I want to do and why I want to do it and how I want to do it. You do err. Not knowing the scriptures. But he didn't stop there. He said, nor the power of God. You realize that book in your lap is more than just black and white, uh, b- black on a white sheet or red on a white sheet. There's the power of God behind that book in your lap. And they thought they were going to manipulate Jesus Christ and drive at Jesus Christ, but they're so stupid. They're so foolish. They thought they had him backed up into a corner and he rebukes them and sets them straight. And I'll be honest with you, some of you this morning are in a position where you're going to get rebuked by Jesus Christ if you don't think, you don't read, and you don't pay attention to what the Bible teaches above and beyond what you want it to say because you like sipping your liquor. Because you like smoking your joints. Because you've somehow or another justified your immoral relationship. You can trick mommy, you can trick daddy, you can trick grandma and grandpa, but I'm halfway between most of you and your parents. Amen. Be careful. You're going to get it in the neck. Justifying yourself all the way to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Now let's dive in. I'm preaching this morning. Are you okay? Can you all breathe? (sighs) Let's breathe together. It's getting kind of tense in here. You know I'm not being mean at you, right? I am trying to help you this morning. Now, they don't know the scriptures. Why? They're corrupted in their doctrine. He says, Moses writes this, that, and the other thing. If a man's brother die, leave his wife. And they gives him all that Moses has to say, but all he's seeing is the worldly side of it. Then they want to set him up and say, now what about heaven? Verse 23, in the resurrection, they think they got him. Jesus said, you're so far off, you don't understand the future. You understand, Christian, you might dabble around in drinking and all that kind of thing, but you're not looking down the road. You're going to sip your alcohol, and maybe you can handle it because you think you can. And maybe, I'm, I'm not stupid. I know some people have a glass of wine their whole life and never become alcoholics. Don't look at me. Don't, 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 I'm not stupid. But just because you don't doesn't mean your kid won't. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You should have done something sooner. Waited till this point. Let's look at some verses. This is the real issue. Romans chapter 14. Just hang with me here. We'll be done shortly. And you can get out of here and go have a glass of wine or whatever you want to do. I'm being sarcastic. Romans chapter 14. Watch this. (laughs) Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. But not to doubtful disputations. All right, receive that guy that's weak in the faith. For one believeth he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him, now watch it in verse number three. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Don't meddle in each other's life. Don't come to me, do you know they have a glass of wine with their meal? Don't meddle. Did you hear what I said? Mind your own business and serve Jesus Christ. 
Now watch, verse 4. By the way, if I know somebody does, I won't have them serving in here. And you'll see why in a minute. I, I, I won't knowingly have an assistant pastor or a deacon or something like that that's in a position of leadership around here that does, and you'll see why in a minute. Verse 4, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day to the Lord, regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. Uh, um, where did I go? Uh, eat. There it is. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he that he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us, now watch it, none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. So can you say, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this joint. I ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Help me to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. You laugh and I'm serious. Can you? And be sincere? For whether we live unto the Lord or whether we die, whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Verse 8, whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. To this end, Christ both died and rose and revived. Now watch it. Here's a mistake in your Bible. That he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. What did we read in Mark 12? He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, didn't we? Mistake. He said right here, he's the Lord of the dead and of the living, right? No, not at all. Back there it said God. He's talking about the God of the Old Testament. Here he's talking about Jesus Christ. Back in the Old Testament, it was all about this earth. Have you noticed? He promised Israel, you do right, I'll bless you with the land. You do good, I'll give you money. You do good, I'll bless you. You do good, I'll give you health. You mess up, I'll judge you. I'll take your wealth, I'll take your health, I'll mess you up. In the Old Testament, it was all about this earth. In the New Testament, it ain't about this earth anymore. It's about heaven. It's about where we're going. It's not just this life. It's the life to come. That's why it's different. Hmm. You don't know the power of God, do you? You're messing your scriptures up. Let's keep going. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You let me tell you, Christian, you don't like something somebody else is doing and it bothers you and it's, and it's messing with you and you don't think they should be doing it, you just leave them to God. I'm not trying to say, don't be judgmental. We're not gonna, I'm not trying to say that and get liberal and sloppy around here. I'm saying they will answer for it. And God will judge them. And it's a full-time job for Pastor Mike Reagan to worry about Mike Reagan. That's a full-time job. And you'll answer to Jesus Christ. I just dish it up and feed you. And then I oversee the church and the workers in the church. Verse 11. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now you stand there and say, Well, Lord, you know, uh, brother so-and-so did it. And God will say, Yeah, but how were you raised? Well, Lord, you know... Sister so-and-so, yeah, but let me show you her background real quick. How was yours? That's kind of scary, isn't it? Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Uh-oh. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, it is unclean. To him it is unclean. But if thy brother, watch it, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Whatsoever is that? Good and acceptable. Acceptable to God. You, if, you, if you'll say, I got liberty to do something, but I won't do it, lest I offend somebody else. You have just moved from a good level to an acceptable level in your service for Jesus Christ. 
There's perfect yet to come. But it's acceptable to say, you know what? I could justify smoking a joint. I could justify drinking a beer. I could justify certain things in my life. But I'm not going to do those things because I want to serve God and I don't want to be a stumbling block to one of my brethren. He said it's acceptable before God. Now you've just graduated. Hey, that's a good thing. Verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. Nowadays, nobody says, is it right or wrong to eat a steak? Right? Praise the Lord, man. I'm glad that's not a problem nowadays because I like steak. Amen. In their culture, it was a problem. So he said, if steak is going to trip up a new Christian, don't eat it. Really? You know, God wrote this book in such a way that if you're not careful, you won't know the scriptures and you won't understand the power of God. He wrote this book so that it would jump all centuries of all times and span all cultures everywhere in the world. So do you realize that some places on this planet you can do something and it won't be a sin and in other places in America you can't do the same thing because it would be a sin? You don't know the power of God and so you're dabbling in sin and you're going to get yourself in a mess because you've got a verse to justify what you want the Bible to say because you like your sin. Oops. You know, if you go to the Philippines, I think I'm feeling the call to the Philippines right now. You can't wear a suit like this and a tie. That makes me feel called, amen. Because they think you're a JW or a Mormon and it truly offends the church. If I walked in justifying saying, I wear a suit. I ain't no charismatic. I ain't no contemporary liberal preacher. I wear a suit on Sundays. Bless God. I'd be sinning against the church. You know, in America, we have a real problem with families, people, children getting killed because somebody's out driving drunk. And the problem in America is going to get worse. We have an alcohol problem and a drug addiction problem that is skyrocketing. People are turning from God, from the Bible, from church, from true joy to the pleasures of this life. And it's wrecking our culture. It's destroying homes. It's ruining children. These kids are smoking dope younger and younger and younger. And it ain't making them smarter. Pothead theologians. Stinking ear, take the fire out of me. All you want to do is it's circular reasoning. What's the point of it? It makes you feel good. Don't play any other games. It's not that addictive. It's not that strong. Don't play any stinking games with me. You do it because it feels good. And you're so in tune with your flesh. I just like the taste of beer. Right. I like the taste of liquor. Uh Uh-huh. There's one reason to drink. And if you say, yeah, amen, there's one reason to drink, and you drink, you're saying, I am a carnal, baby, shallow Christian who is willing to sin against Jesus Christ and sin against my brethren because I like the way my flesh feels. Study your Bible. Alcohol and immorality go together. Your inhibitions are lower, and you'll do things and say things and act ways you would not normally act. Be not drunk with wine. We're in his excess. We're in his excess. We're in his excess. Study the English of it. There's excess in liquor. Real quiet. You have the first one, and you're like, yeah, one more ain't going to hurt. It has excess in it. It leads you to one point, drunkenness. And we all know drunkenness is a sin. So why would you dabble around with something that is going to lead somewhere where you're going to sin against God, mess up your home, make some mistakes, and hurt your brothers and sisters in Christ? I told you Brother Todd used to work in a bar, didn't I? I told you that on purpose, prayerfully, before I told it. Ask the man what he thinks of liquor. Ask him what he thinks, Christian. Ask Brother D what he thinks of it. By the grace of God, the man's still married because God got a hold of him. He got in church and put it in his past. But it about ruined a man with a lot of skills and a good job and a good family. I mean, we can move on down the line and don't say you can't beat it. Because God bless Brother Paul, he dropped it the day he got saved. And that's been over a year. At 61 years old, he dropped it. At 60 years old, dropped it. 
after how many years, 50, 40 years or whatever it was, he dropped it. God can help you with it. But you say, oh, it's just a social drink. And then a new Christian comes along and sees a brother sitting across the aisle who's just a social drink that struggled with it and about ruined his life and dealt with it. And it kept him from Jesus Christ for 30 years. It kept him from the Lord. And he finally got a grip on it, came to Jesus Christ, got saved, got the victory. And now you're going to mess him up because you just want to dabble around in it. You're, make, you're making me stinking mad. Say, why? Because I care about him. I spent a year with him, discipling him. I, you don't know how much time I've spent with Brother Dave. You don't know how much time has been spent with Brother Todd. And you don't know how many people that stuff has ruined. How many homes it's wrecked. How many times somebody wound up cheating on their spouse because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time under the wrong influence. And we want to sit back and say, well, I got a verse of scripture. Grow up. Grow up. You're playing around with it because it's fun. Admit it. And that's the only reason, and you're not worried about who it's going to hurt. You know how many lost people would look? How many of you, let me just ask you a question. How many of you would praise Jesus if on the way home today, I expose you, you know, it's not in the law, and here's some verses of scripture for you, and it's okay, and you pass me coming out of the party store with a fifth in my hand. How would that make you feel? You'd be like, well, I mean, you love me, don't you? I think. <laughs> How would that make you feel? Sick. I'll help you. I know I'm not trying to embarrass you. Well, that would bother Brother Kevin. Brother Paul, it would bother you, wouldn't it? Brother D, he's worth it to me. He's worth it to lay down my liberty, not to hurt him. And you know what the devil will do? He'll show some of you young people just enough Bible to bait you and start dragging you in. Oh, I can handle it. I'm strong in the Lord. I was raised in such a way where I can handle it. I know the King James Bible and I'm in a good church and I've got good doctrine. I can handle it. I'm strong. And preacher, don't you read Romans 14, he that is weak in the faith, so you're the weak one and I'm the strong one. Yeah, you know what Paul said? Yeah, I am, I am the weak one, by the way. I am the weak one. I'm scared to death of the stuff. You know what Paul said? For when I am, then I am strong. So when you say, I'm too weak, I, I'm not having a social drink. Friends, no, no thank you. I'm not, I'm not going there because I don't know if I can handle it. I think I probably could, but you know, the stuff's pretty strong, and I got a very, very, very powerful adversary. You either err not knowing the scriptures of the power of God. You also err not knowing the power of your enemy. He's been studying them for 6,000 years, brother, and he knows just exactly how to set you up, just exactly how to manipulate your mind to get you going a direction. And he can and will take you down. Don't give me this junk that you know the Bible well enough and you're spiritual enough and you were raised and blah, blah, blah. Forget all that. He will get you. Why would you mess around with it if there's even a chance he's going to get you? If there's even a chance he's going to get your children, why play with it? You see, I haven't told you yet, if you have a social drink, I'm kicking you out, have I? But man, I hope you got enough this morning to chew on for a little while. Why mess with them? You know what they've been doing to Brother Paul at work? You know what they've been doing to him? They've been torturing him. Hey, we're going for a drink, why don't you come? I told you. I told you, December 2012, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior and I haven't had a drink since. I'm not going. Amen. And then he comes into church and there's some people who want to sit around saying, well, I got a verse for you. How would that feel if that was you? God help us, man. Justify, justify, justify. Letter of the law instead of the Spirit. Look at the last thing. Back in your text. I wanted to read 1 Corinthians 8 to you, but I just ran out of time this morning. Back in Mark 12, I want you to see the last thing, and this is the heart of the issue right here. The last man shows up and asks a question, and his question was the right one. He says, Lord, where's he at? Verse 28. 
Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yes, verse 28. One of the scribes came to him, having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he'd answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Why is that the right question? You know what he essentially said? What wouldst thou have me do? He didn't say, all right, here's a hypothetical. All right, now there's the government and there's Bible. All right. He said, Lord, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? What's the best commandment of all? Jesus looked at him. Now there's an honest question, so here's an honest answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Just love the Lord. Well, the second commandment, by the way, is like it, like your neighbor, but love your neighbors yourself. That's the issue. Do you love God? Do you love God? All right. Then who cares about a drink? Who cares about a joint? You got joy in the Lord? Do you have joy in the Lord? What do you need liquor for? Do you have joy in the Lord? Do you ever get raptured up in prayer? What do you need a joint for? Why do you need to get high? <clears throat> Why do you need to get high? What for? If you don't have the Lord, I understand. I, I would too, man. I want to escape from this life. But my escape is Jesus. And I love him. So I don't want to do anything that would hurt him or make him look bad. And I don't want to do anything, the second commandment, that would hurt you. So I might have liberty, but I gladly lay it down because of him and for you. The passage we didn't read is 1 Corinthians 8. You know what he said you do? He said when you sin against a weaker brother, you sin against Christ. It's not a sin to drink a glass of wine. Is there somebody in your church you'd offend? Is there some lost person at work that's heard it's wrong that you would offend? You're sinning against Jesus Christ personally to do something that would hurt somebody else. Stand to your feet if you would, please. We are not going to have an invitation this morning because it would be kind of awkward. All you potheads and drunkards, would you come forward and get right with God? <laughs> but I hope this morning I gave you some food for thought. I hope this morning I warned some of you, the scriptures warned you sufficiently. I want you to go home. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to consider. And it may not have anything to do with alcohol. It may not have anything to do with pot. It may not have anything to do with shacking up and immorality and gay marriage and all the rest of this foolishness that's going on in our society. But are you thinking about Jesus Christ and the decisions you make? Are you thinking about your brothers and sisters? Are you living a life that would please the Lord? I've never sought to put anybody under the law around here. You have to wear this and you can't wear that and you can't go here and you can't do the other and you can't. I don't preach all that foolishness. I'm after your heart. Will you give your heart to the Lord? Will you inspect your life and say, Lord, are the things in my life pleasing to you or am I getting set up by my adversary? Am I getting read, led the wrong way? Am I getting lured in by the world? Don't get destroyed by foolishness. Because the devil throws a verse at you. Father, we love you this morning. I know this isn't a super shout em up message, but I pray you'd help us, God, to understand the scriptures and the power of God. And help us also to understand our adversary and how powerful he is, Lord. And how he seeks to destroy our...